Welcome to your favourite day of the week everyone, and throughout history, people have been given the death penalty for committing some of the most heinous crimes known to mankind. These executions could have took the form of a beheading, a hanging, or maybe a firing squad for example, in order to dispose of the victim as quickly as possible. Now I imagine if you're on the receiving end of this execution, you'd want it over with as swiftly and as mercifully as possible. But what happens when that doesn't happen? Today, we're going to take a look at some of the most botched executions in history where the victim didn't get off all too easily. The Resurrection of William Jewell I thought we'd start off our list of quite a light execution compared to the rest of them, as the ones later on we talk about are a lot more bloody and savage. On the 24th of November 1740, Jewell, along with four other men, were due to be hanged due to the rape and murder of a young woman. As Jewell hung from the gallows, his body lost all signs of consciousness and life, and around 20 minutes later, he was cut down and pronounced dead. His body was then taken to a medical college to be dissected and analysed, which was a common practice at the time for criminals' bodies. At the time, dissection was viewed as a cultural and religious prejudice, making bodies extremely hard to come by for medical students in order to further their research, so they sent them the bodies of criminals. As fate would have it, however, William Jewell was not ready for the dissection table just yet. As his body lay on the medical student's table, one of them noticed that he slowly started to breathe. Jewel began to awake, but he had no recollection of his hanging. It was said during his trial he was suffering from fever and delirium, and it's said that this ultimately saved his life that day. So now we have the problem. What do you do with a man who's alive, but is legally dead? A retrial was held, and the concern came up that rescheduling his execution would make a mockery of the law and show the general public that the death penalty could be escaped. Jewel's survival was also surely a sign from God, as if fate hadn't intervened that day, he would surely now be dead. So, in the end, they exiled him off to North America, where it's said he lived the rest of his days in Boston until he died in 1805. The Shooting of Wallace Wilkinson On June 11th, 1877, Wallace Wilkinson was playing a game of cards for money with William Baxter, when an argument broke out over accusations of cheating. Baxter tried to back down from the struggle, but Wilkinson shot him in the forehead and temple, killing him instantly. Wilkerson was soon found guilty of the crime and chose to be executed by firing squad over the other options of beheading and hanging. On the 16th of May 1879, Wilkerson was due to be executed and sat roughly 30 feet away from the firing squad. He denied the blindfold and said the restraints were unnecessary. He stated, I give you my word, I intend to die like a man, looking my executioners right in the eye. A white paper target was then placed over the heart of Wilkinson, and he said, Aim for my heart, Marshal. As the countdown ended for the men to shoot, Wilkinson stiffened up slightly, unintentionally moving the target. The bullets missed his heart, with one shattering his arm and the rest going in the torso. He leaped off his chair in agony. Oh my god, my god, they've missed it. Wilkinson was struggling on the ground as four doctors rushed to him, and then the officials then questioned should they shoot him again but roughly 27 minutes later, he died from bleeding out. Not the nicest way to go, really. The Execution of Thomas Cromwell Between 1534 to 1540, Cromwell was Henry VIII's chief minister and the king's right-hand man. Cromwell was a key figure in the Reformation of England, Henry's annulment to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and the downfall and execution of Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn. Cromwell made many enemies during his time in court, and it was Henry's marriage to his fourth wife, Anne of Cleves, in 1540 that was ultimately his downfall. Cromwell was the mastermind behind the marriage, but only six months later, the marriage was annulled, under the grounds that it was not consummated. Henry said he found it extremely difficult to have sex with someone he found so unattractive. It was Cromwell who persuaded Henry to marry Anne after he provided him with an extremely flattering portrait of her and told him exaggerated claims of her beauty. Henry had been the 16th century equivalent of being catfished and upon meeting Anne, he claimed, I like her not, I like her not. Only six months after the marriage of Anne, Cromwell's enemies in court had convinced the king that he was a traitor. Cromwell was put to death by beheading on the 28th of July, 1540, the same day of Henry's marriage to his fifth wife, Catherine Howard. Evidence of Cromwell's execution comes from historian Edward Hall, who writes, He patiently suffered the stroke of the axe by a ragged and butcherly miser who very ungoodly performed the office. It is said that the inexperienced executioner took roughly two to three swings to hack off Cromwell's head, 
which sounds extremely painful and bloody miserable. A very gory end we wouldn't even wish on the most controversial figures like Cromwell. The Free Executions of John Smith John Smith was a soldier in London who turned to housebreaking and burglary after becoming associated with some bad acquaintances. On the 5th of December 1705, he was convicted of two crimes and sentenced to death on Christmas Eve that same year. Smith was in the hangman's noose for roughly 15 minutes, with it said people in the crowd were pushing and holding his legs so he wouldn't succumb to death. After 15 minutes, the crowd chanted a reprieve and a reprieve was given to him and he was cut down. Upon being asked about his feelings, he replied, he remembered the great pain caused by the weight of his body. And when he was cut down, I got such pins and needles in my head that I could have hanged the people who set me free. Now I'm sure we've all woken up in the middle of the night with pins and needles in our leg, so painful we can't move. Now imagine that pain straight to your head. Smith was granted his freedom and soon became known as Half Hang Smith but he soon turned back to his life of crime. On his second conviction, the jury left the verdict to 12 judges due to complications in the case, and they decided he was to be released. But he soon returned for his third conviction, and it seemed definite that the judge would put him to death this time. Smith's luck continued though, and the prosecutor died the day before his trial, and it was agreed upon again that Smith would be set free. But the life of crime escapes no man, and on the 17th of May 1627, 66-year-old Smith was caught stealing again and found guilty of theft. There was no death penalty for him this time though, as he was sentenced to be transported to Virginia. He lodged an appeal requesting physical punishment instead of this transportation due to his physical condition and role as a father. The court took no pity on him however, and he was soon exiled off to America to live the rest of his days. It's unsure what happened to him, but this is just another case of someone lucky enough to escape the hangman's noose. Margaret Pohl, the bloodiest end. So I thought I'd save the most savage and gory execution to the end, and if you have stuck around this far, thank you, it's well worth it for this one. Margaret Pohl, the Countess of Salisbury, was one of the few surviving members of the House Plantagenet at the end of the War of the Roses. Henry VIII was the king and the member of the House Tudor who had won the war, and at the beginning of his reign, she was in favour. This all changed, however, when her son spoke up against the separation of Henry and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Tensions began to rise, and upon the discovery of a conspiracy to overthrow Henry VIII and replace him with his cousin, Henry Courtney, Margaret, her two sons, and Courtney were arrested on suspicion of treason. The Plantagenet bloodline was now a threat to Henry, and Margaret was stripped of all her lands and titles in order to minimise the chance of rebellion against him. She was kept in the Tower of London for roughly two and a half years until the 27th of May, 1541, where on the morning she was told she would die within the hour. Two eyewitness accounts of the execution survive, one from the French ambassador, Marillac, and one from the Holy Roman Emperor Ambassador, Chapuis. Their accounts differ slightly on how many people were present, ranging from only a few to about 150. Chapuis wrote, At first when the sentence of death was made known to her, she found the thing very strange, not knowing of what crime she was accused, nor how she would be sentenced. At the time of her execution, the main executioner was in the north of England, dealing with a rebellion that had risen up against Henry. The execution is said to have been performed by a wretched and blundering youth who literally hacked her head and shoulders to pieces in the most pitiful manner. It is said that the inexperienced axeman missed her neck on the first try, striking the back of her head, and it soon took a further 10 blows to separate the neck from the body, and he made a bloody mess of the torso. Now I can't even imagine what this would have been like for Margaret. As we said earlier, you'd want your death over as quickly as possible, but you turn up to the execution stand ready to get your head chopped off, you're ready to go, you've come to terms with your death, but you've got a drunken youth who's never held an axe before. You'd be mortified, but what can you do? You're gonna die, they don't care. They don't care, they just watch it. It's a spectacle, it goes down in the history books, that's why we're talking about it today. The closest analogy I can give is you've gone to a five star restaurant and they've picked the dirtiest homeless person to cook your meal and he's never, he's never held a cooking spoon before. It would be an awful experience for everyone. So thank you all for watching the video, I hope you all enjoyed it. Let me know if there's another topic in history you'd be interested about learning about that hopefully I can make a video on. Again, thank you to all my subscribers and thank you to everyone who supports the channel by liking the videos and watching them. I appreciate it, I appreciate it. I hope you all enjoyed today's video. I've been Jamie's Day, your favourite day of the week and this was the most botched executions in history. I'll see you all later, peace.